by the public defender, Don Diener. Don, nice to see you and great to have you. I know you brought a couple folks with you, so I'll let you introduce them in a second. Just want to recognize that we have, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, Council Member John Cooper with us, as well as Council Member uh, Taneka Vercher is with us. And uh, I think that's all the council members I see. We also have Judge Linda Jones, although she didn't want me to tell her. Hi, Linda. <laughs> Um, and what we're going to do is uh, just remind the folks at home that we are, our, uh, you know, the, the asks for funds will exceed the amount of revenue that we have. Uh, and so as we go through these budget hearings, we are thankful that the departments are so thoughtful about their requests. And what we will do is at the end, take all of those requests and then best allocate those dollars back out uh, for what's best for the Davidson County taxpayers. So to you, Public Defender Diener. Thank you, Mary Berry. Uh, I have with me today Annette Crutchfield, who is our Administrative Services Manager, uh, who keeps me uh, working like clockwork over at the office, and I'm very appreciative for, for her excellent work. Um, so I can talk a little bit about um, some of the budget requests that we've made or answer any other questions. Sure. Perhaps. Let me just uh, point out that General Funk is also with us. Uh, General Funk is still here. Uh, why don't we start with the, the staff enhancements. You've got a request for 11 new FTEs. Uh, talk a minute about what those FTEs would, would do and help and what they would do to make uh, your job uh, better for the, the, the folks that you serve. Absolutely. So the initial staff enhancements <coughs> that we've requested would be for two investigators and one social worker. Uh, and that would be to um, make sure or to help us get to the point where we can meet our representation standards to all of the clients that we are representing. Um, and, and let's talk about that for a moment because I think sure. that that goes right into when you talk about the standard that you are uh, supposed to operate under uh, that at the moment because of, of that there's some inability to do that so you're having to put some of those uh, that workload off to to uh, other entities, and what does that do? Sure. So um, there was an article in the scene a few <clears throat> months ago related to workload controls that we started implementing in our office a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and those are basically um, designed to help us ensure that we are meeting the constitutional right to counsel that every client of the office is entitled to receive. Um, the law requires anybody who's going through the court system to make sure that they get an effective, um, represent, uh, effective representation from their lawyer. <clears throat> and frankly, good lawyering takes time. Uh, there's just the components of all of the things that you need to do to provide quality representation, which is meeting with your client, talking about the facts of the case, doing an independent investigation, researching uh, legal issues, filing motions, um, looking into mitigation, if uh, there's going to be a sentencing hearing in the case. Um, so all of those things take time and are the components of quality effective representation. We have for decades been operating in our office with a <coughs> workload that far exceeds the standards, the maximum standards that have been, uh, in Tennessee at least, uh, advisable. There are not mandatory standards in the state of Tennessee for how many cases a public defender can handle in a year. Uh, but there are advisory guidelines that have existed since the late 90s. And we have far exceeded those guidelines in our office for decades. So this is not a new problem? It is not a new problem. Um, but I think what we are doing is, is taking a new approach to how to deal with that. And we've done that with a, a realization that the individuals who are harmed when lawyers try to represent too many clients uh, are the individuals who we are representing. Uh, they suffer. Um, they don't get the kinds of representation that they need. And that can result in um, innocent people being convicted. It can result in people staying in jail longer than they should be in jail. It can result in people receiving longer sentences than they should receive. Um, it results in injustice. And it contributes to what is an overall problem, not, in na not just in Nashville, but nationally, <coughs> of um, the perception and sometimes reality of two criminal justice systems, one for wealthy people and one for poor people. And the clients of the Public Defender's Office are entitled to receive the same quality of representation that they could get if they could go and hire uh, a lawyer of their choice. And so we are, the approach we are now taking is feeling um, a sense of obligation and necessity 
uh, and legal obligation to get our workloads to a capacity to, to reduce them to a capacity where we can provide every client with effective constitutional representation. And there's two ways to do that. There is increasing the supply of lawyers uh, and other staff members. And to that's direct hire as part of the PD office. Sure, okay. yes. And then there is reducing the demand upon services. Uh, and so the first one, increasing supply, is fairly straightforward. It's hiring new staff, and it's finding the funds to hire those staff. Uh, and that, in Metro, can come from two sources. Uh, Metro contributes funding to our office. The state contributes funding to our office. Now, uh, we, we just heard from, the, um, from General Funk that, that he has 70 lawyers that are provided by the state. Or some such. Or he has 70 lawyers. I, if I understood him correctly, I was taking notes. 40 uh, provided by the state. 40 30, by the state. I think. Maybe 30. Yeah. 40 so 30. 40 30. Split. And so, what's, what's your division there? How many come, How many are paid for from the state from you? Or So, we're not set up that yeah, way. All of it. our staff are Metro employees uh, because our office uh, has existed since the Metro Charter. And there was no public defender system in the state of Tennessee when uh, the Metro Charter was created. So all of our positions are metro positions, and we have, I think, 45, 46 lawyers in our office. And, um, and so the state <clears throat> just contributes a block sum Got of it. money. So they just give you cash? They give metro money, right? right. And so it all comes through. So when, when somebody looks at the budget document and sees that our current budget for this year is $8.1 million, $8 million mm -hmm. roughly, 2.2 million of that is a state appropriation, and then Metro funds the, the balance. Okay. Um, when they look at the, the DA's office budget, they're just seeing what Metro is funding for the DA. I see. Um, so that's okay. the, the difference. Interesting. Ours includes everything. Um, and so obviously we are, we are at a 25, 30% of our total operating budget is coming from state dollars, and the rest is coming from Metro for what is legally a state obligation. And hasn't that decreased over time? Didn't it has. There used to be a lot more state dollars? Yes, so back in the early, in, in the <coughs> early 90s, we were at a roughly 50-50. Uh, and that has gradually decreased, so Metro has taken on more and more responsibility over the years. And a few years ago, we mounted a campaign to try to address this with the state, and we got some additional recurring funds from them at that time, about a half a million dollars. And then the statute was amended that controls how the state funds public defense for metro government uh, to tie it to the consumer price index increases. And that has um, resulted in us not getting much additional state funding in subsequent years. How much um, did you tell me that you got last year? What was the $2,200 $2, for our $2 million appropriation from okay. the state. Um, well, your state funding hadn't gone down. Just that it has to, the metro has the just metro increased. Share metro well, shares continue to grow. Your state money has sort of been flat, correct. with a little bit of a bump a couple of years ago. So it's not like right. you haven't lost state money. You just had, it had, we've had to it hasn't kept up with right. it. And if the office is going to grow, metro's had to put more money right. into it. So exactly right. correct. Yeah. And and it's really uh, I think challenging for metro as an entity to lobby the state for additional funding for public defense in metro. We are one mm -hmm. jurisdiction and throughout the entire state. And so our, our state funding, I think our reality today is recognizing that we are limited in the additional state funding that we can get. And so if we're going to, we're at our, we've reached our peak in terms of what we can do to address supply, to address hiring more lawyers to deal with the more cases at the state level. Um, so one option that we have for limiting supply is to declare conflicts on cases that are above the number of cases we think we can ethically handle and ask the courts to appoint private attorneys to represent those individuals. And so that was the strategy that we adopted two years ago and what we have continued to do. And, and then um, those, they get paid out of the By the state, state government out of the indigent defense fund. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, an, it's another way to sort of bring the state funding into Metro. Right. Um, there are downsides to that, though, and that is that the private appointed council system, uh, frankly, doesn't have the kinds of checks and balances and oversight and quality measurements that a public defender's office does. And so, um, you know, there really is little to no oversight over the lawyers uh, and their practice for individuals who are appointed a private attorney. How, how are they chosen? How do, where do they come from? Um, they are 
the, the judges uh, make the decision of who to appoint by lawyers, and usually they're drawing from a pool of lawyers who have gone to the courthouse and said they're willing to take court appointments. Um, many of them are right out of law school, um, not, at, not all of them, and so again, I'm speaking in generalities, um, but there's no, they don't have a supervisor. Uh, if there's a complaint about the quality of representation or that their lawyer doesn't return their call or won't There's no them. oversight from your department at all on these cases? There is not. Is there an ability to do that? Is there an ability to hire a supervisor who would then oversee all of the uh, private lawyers to so make sure there was some accountability? Is that not possible? out of our office, um, and I think that there would be there could be some logistical issues about that. I don't think it's necessarily impossible, and I think that that would be an idea where Metro could really um, uh, be a pioneer uh, if the if we don't see reform in indigent defense statewide in the next few years. The Supreme Court right now has a task force that's going to issue a report next month that I expect is going to recommend some sweeping. Uh, reforms. Now, whether or not those get passed remains to be seen. If they did, I think that could remedy a lot of those, <coughs> those problems. Um, so do, we've got supply and demand sure. issues, and, and so we are still operating as of fiscal 16, mm. took on 10,000 more misdemeanor cases than the maximum caseload standards said we should be at. And so in, starting in January, we implemented additional workload conflicts to reduce our caseload within the next 18 months by 10,000 cases. And that's painful. That's a lot of cases. Um, we one of, So one of our budget requests, in addition to the additional investigator in, in social worker, we need to manage, even if we, if we could cut those cases, we would right. still need investigators and a social worker to handle the reduced workload appropriately. Um, but several of the positions that we've requested would be to roll back the workload conflicts that we just implemented in January. And I think that's a strategy decision that, that Metro government needs to make in terms of whether or not Metro wants to um, contribute to the cost of, of defending those cases or continue to try to press for the state to um, I include its fair share for representation in Davidson County. Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm intrigued by this idea that you would have the ability to get the state to pay for the indigent <coughs> component and use the private attorneys with some kind of accountability through your office. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as a kind of a best of both worlds. I, I, I'm, I'm way over my element here, so I, <laughs> let me apologize before I go further into it. But, 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 you know, I think the, the concern on your part is that the, the attorneys that are chosen by the judges um, don't have the experience level or the right. or the oversight level. Just don't have the experience really to, to, to handle some of these cases. But if there was a if the judge, excuse me, the courts would agree, if there was some kind of I hate to use the word school or some kind of process that we could put together where, you know, they would be qualified, recognized. Uh, is that is that what you're thinking about that you could get to some <coughs> kind of mechanism like that with, as, a, as a pilot? No, you said no one else is really doing anything like that in terms of oversight. Right. Um, I don't. I don't think a school does the trick. I think it's a start. Um, but I, I think certainly now, as a supervisor in a public defender's office, um, if a client of my office has a complaint or a concern about how the lawyer assigned to their representation is handling things, they can call me and talk to me about it. I can intervene. And frankly, when you're talking about young lawyers, a lot of times intervention is appropriate. Supervisory uh, involvement of a more experienced attorney is appropriate. Uh, somebody with criminal defense experience. Um, so I, I think that there is a structure that can be put, be put in place. There are other places we'll use something that they would call like a conflict defender's office. Um, again, I don't know that you'd want an entire administrative structure around that. Um, and right. I, don't I mean, it sounds, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, you're not, you're trading one budget for another budget when you could just bring sure. the, the pieces into your budget and then call it a day. Right. And so I think, uh, for me, um, I would really like to see what develops in the state with the Supreme Court's task force over the next year. I think the, the idea is that the task force will release its report, there will be some legislative suggestions, um, and a push to see what will happen in the next legislative session around those reforms. And then um, we decide where we go from there. So if you got your three FTEs, the two, that you're, the two um, investigators and then the one social worker at the moment, mm -hmm in lieu of that report, 
Right. Would that be a good stopgap at the moment until that comes out? I think so. I mean, I, I think that, that that would be a wise approach. And again, I'm a little conflicted here. I understand. Because I am a metro elected public defender, and I think that I have a, a constituency of those who elect uh, and, and who are residents of this city. But I also have a loyalty to make sure that the individuals we represent uh, are, and, and that indigent criminal defendants in Davidson County get high quality public defense. And I think the highest quality public defense they can get is through our office uh, and through our office being properly resourced. Um, so I, I, there, are, there are two hats there essentially. But I do think that for the time being, um, a wise approach is to look and see what happens in the legislative session next year on the heels of the Supreme Court's uh, task force recommendations. And if there isn't some reform that comes through, then, then Metro can look at how can we be creative about making sure that uh, those clients who don't, aren't represented by the Public Defender's Office are getting the best representation possible. Um, which leads me to have to um, make a point that, general, that stems from General Funk's comments during his budget hearing. Um, let the record reflect uh, that he is uh, anxiously awaiting anxiously, to hear this. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, first of all, I want to say <clears throat> that I heard his remarks about the, the pay scale issues for him. And I, I can support him in that we have, on the heels of uh, your administration last year making the decision to implement a new pay plan structure, um, that significantly helped uh, and addressed the underpayment issue or, or, or low salaries for lawyers in our office has significantly helped our turnover rates. We were experiencing the same problem he described prior to the pay scale change. And so um, I, I can't say thank you enough, uh, and I appreciate the fact that last year you addressed the pay scale issue and it has made a huge difference. Our turnover is way down. Uh, and I do feel like now when we invest in folks that there is an incentive for them to stay uh, and, it, and it has helped in recruiting. Um, in Nashville, we've got a waiting list of people who want to come work at the Public Defender's Office here. Um, and I think that's because Nashville is a great, great city and I think it's uh, because we've got a great Public Defender's Office, but I also think it's because the salary is competitive. Right. Um, and so I, I, I feel for him in that. Um, the correction I need to make is in his description of um, the DA's office as people who get paid to protect the community as opposed to at the public defender's office, people who are representing the indigent criminal accused. And frankly, I see the public defender's role as just as much as protecting this community uh, as the DA's office. Um, we protect the community perhaps in a different way, but we protect the community from wrongful convictions. We protect the community's constitutional rights. We protect the community in making sure that they have equal justice. And so I just wanted to say that I think that it's important for everybody to understand that, that um, I, I appreciate the fact that Metro has long seen it important to equalize both of these offices. And I have always felt that the Metro sees the value in both a strong prosecutor's office and an equally strong public defender's office and that we have equally important roles in protecting the community. Um, and I think General Funk agrees with that, too. Um, but language matters, and so I just wanted to say that. Would He's you, changed. You, you, have, yes. you, have five, you have 30 <laughs> second rebuttal time if you, if you would choose oh, to. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think so anyway. it's, I, I, to your point, I think it's important to have uh, strong offices on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, it they, is. The, the, whole, the, the system doesn't work unless you have both. And exactly. so making sure that uh, we have both. That, uh, that are functioning at a very high level is, is important. So yeah. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to add on behalf of the judges, all of the judges, is that we do conduct trainings for attorneys who are paid by the AOC out of the state pot. And there are routinely lawyers who remove from the list if they are not performing on a regular basis and going to the continual training that is very inexpensive. So, um, all of my colleagues have different requirements for the attorneys they employ. We do a general sessions training twice a year. Many are instructed to go through a Tennessee Association of Criminal Defense Lawyer training as well. And um, lawyers are routinely removed if they're not performing uh, to the standards set by the ADA. So there's a general. Mm -hmm. okay. The only other thing that I would offer um, is, that, is that demand side, right? So mm -hmm. we've got supply and demand. And I think General Funk 
started on this, and, and I would uh, end any of my remarks uh, here with, we are continuing to work on how can we reduce demand for public defender services, right? There are so many things that are coming through the criminal justice system that don't need to be there. Uh, driver's license prosecutions are one of them. And so the steering clear PIP. The steering clear that you are. Right. Pip, pip, pip I got a PIP. She's making a PIP. Put a plug in for the steering clear PIP. Yeah, um, the steering clear. You know, the, the mental right. health diversion. Right. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that as, as many things, the restorative justice uh, yep. in juvenile court, as many things as we can be doing as a city yep. to recognize what are those things that are coming through the criminal justice system in an ineffective way and can are problems that could be much better dealt with outside the system have rollback costs for the criminal justice system. So as we talk about body cameras and how that will have positive or, or require additional demands on the criminal justice system, what are the areas where we can get things out of the system right. and how find do we savings? Make some, right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and can you just talk for a minute, because I think that one of the things that you and uh, General Funk were, were able to do around the uh, Christmas holiday was a, a really great example of you two working together. Uh, if you would talk about that for a second. Sure, just um, when holidays happen and the courts close down, um, and it wasn't just General Funk and I, it was General Sessions judge um, was there, Casey Moreland came in to hear that docket, and um, clerk who came in, and sheriff's deputies who come in. Mm -hmm. And the idea being, if, if we can get people out of jail who don't need to be in there, um, just by coming in for a few hours on one morning, then that's what we want to do. Uh, and I appreciated everybody's um, commitment to doing that, <coughs> including all of those agencies. And so, you know, people who stay in jail pre-trial, they're presumed innocent, they don't need to be there. If we can get folks out of jail pre-trial um, who can't afford to make their bail, but maybe there's other ways we can get them out of jail safely, then we need to be doing that. And so uh, I appreciate everybody's collaboration within the criminal justice agencies today on looking for ways that we can be smarter in how we do these things. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any questions, any more, any more? No? Appreciate you. All right, Appreciate thank you guys you. coming down. Thank you so much. And I, that concludes our budget hearings for today. But please join us tomorrow. 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 <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs>